the Kingdom of Lesotho, a country entirely landlocked by South Africa, is possibly the highest country on the African continent. Unusually for Africa, Lesotho has an alpine climate, lots of water and no large game. It also has one of the highest rape rates in Africa, HIV AIDS affects about 25% of the population and it has unacceptably high rates of TB. The country's women are warm and friendly, entrepreneurial, dynamic, successful and inspirational role models for younger generations. I'm Ellen Gunning. I caught up with these women to get their opinions on leadership, education, pressure to conform to cultural expectations, the importance of faith, their responsibility to help other women and their vision for the future. These women are from the worlds of politics, education, sport, business, hospitality and media. This is their story. Now, you left Lesotho at 23 years of age. Yes. Where did you head to? I headed to the then USSR, the um, Soviet Union at the time. We, Why there? We were given scholarships. That time, there was still the, well, the Cold War and the West, and uh, also the political parties that were inclined towards uh, this, the Soviet Union or whatever you want to call it at the time. Okay. So my party, the party that I belong to, which is the Basutan Congress Party, is one of the oldest parties in Lesotho, organized scholarships for students to go abroad. I think the intention was when Lesotho does get independence, at least they should have some educated people who would be in a position to to run the country. There wasn't good education up to that. There was good, th there was good education. There, there was good education in Lesotho, but uh, I mean, okay, the, that time it was the, during the colonial days, so the possibilities and chances of getting scholarships to go out as uh, very very limited. Very slim. Very slim because I mean, people went to Britain, maybe some went to the US, other studied in South Africa, but. Uh, I mean, okay, it, there were not just as many as uh, anybody would like to. So, and when you went to the Soviet Union, what did you study? Pharmacy. Pharmacy. Yes. And how many women got scholarships? I'm just curious, with balance of women and men? Yes, okay. Our group was very interesting. Where the second group, the first group was, uh, I think there were two, two, two boys or two men. Our group was the second group in 1961. And there were 10 of us, eight girls and two boys. Ooh. Very heavily weighted in favour of the girls. <laughs> Very heavily weighted in favour I love that of the one. Girls. Sorry, I keep yeah. interrupting you. So you went to the Soviet <laughs> Union to study. Mm -hmm. Whereabouts in the USSR did you study? Um, the first academic year, we were in Moscow learning the language and introduction to the subject, depending on the course that we were going to take. And then after that, uh, then we were distributed throughout the Soviet Union. I went to Lvov. It was part of. Uh, Poland before the Second World War, so it's in, in Ukraine. The one, the people they call it Lviv, but okay. uh, it's written Lvov anyway. So I went to Lvov Medical School. And what was life like in the Soviet Union as a student then? It was it was very interesting. I can I can tell you. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, in the area where we were, I don't think people had seen black people in the first place. Oh, so you were exotic just by being we were there. Exotic by being black. <laughs> were exotic by being black. And then the interesting part again was that during, that was a time of the very difficult time in the Soviet Union when they, they were shooting of, of almost everything. Okay. But um, I must say the people are very friendly, very fr extremely friendly. And um, the Russians enjoyed, um, I mean the students with whom we studied, enjoyed inviting us to their homes and um, it was quite something. So you became part of the community? We became yeah. part you of the community. You were very accepted. We were very much accepted. And uh, I remember when during the holidays, uh, I mean, our students would organize, I mean, the students from Africa organize uh, a football match with the local community. So we had fun, we had fun. But I think the other interesting thing is we met um, a lot of people from um, from all of most countries in Africa, and then from uh, places like Cuba, the other in Latin America, we met people from Asia. So it, it was 
It exposed you to a melting pot of people really and cultures. Did, it really did. It really did. And from the African point of view, I think it instilled, or maybe because uh, our political party was uh, very pan-Africanist in its uh, way of doing things. But being in Russia, now with so many people from all over Africa, it was very interesting because it sort of strengthened the, um, the pan-Africanist movement. In fact, I remember that uh, at that time, I mean, whenever anything happened unpleasant in one of the African countries, we mm. all sort of mobilized and uh, support each other. The, I think uh, there were two coups in Nigeria at the time, and uh, I mean, we supported the Nigeria. We felt as if we're, we're brothers and sisters. Even. And you needed to carry the flag, which is absolutely. an awful expression, but for every other Absol African abs nation. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So that's, uh, that was life in the Soviet Union. I mean, the language wasn't very easy, I can tell you. <laughs> I, especially I wouldn't <laughs> fancy your job learning the language uh, in a year. Yes, especially the alphabet was something else. But uh, if you had, I had done Latin in school, if you had, you had a little bit of understanding of Latin, then uh, studying the Russian language wasn't very difficult because the declension is more or less like uh, you do in Latin. Okay. So that, that, that helped a lot. Okay. So, Lesotho, you, you won the opportunity to go and study in the Soviet Union. Mm. You went there, you studied pharmacy. Were your parents involved in pharmacy or why pharmacy? No, 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 not I don't know why. I mean, I just sort of uh, liked it. Uh, my mother was a teacher. My father was, um, okay, I don't know what they called them. He, he did shorthand and typing. He was uh, an interpreter at one time in the parliament of Lesotho at that time. Mm -hmm. So, and then uh, my eldest brother did, uh, was um, a veterinary doctor. My other two sisters had done nursing. I don't know why I went there, but anyway. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so you studied pharmacy and then came back to Lesotho to no. practice? No, I went to Tanzania in 1967. The main reason of going to Tanzania was the South African apartheid regime couldn't accept us. I had been declared a persona non grata at, at the time and uh, somebody decided to peddle a story in one of the newspapers. I understand that uh, I had been sent to Russia to go and study explosives so that, uh, well, I mean, I was sort of a, a terrorist as bad as so you were a terrorist or a spy or something, absolutely. you were definitely, uh, yeah, absolutely. you weren't somebody they would welcome absolutely, back. Absolutely, absolutely. So what took you to Denmark? Yes, uh, to Denmark, uh, I was introduced to the people in Denmark by a friend of mine who was in the pharmaceutical unit of the World Health Organization. And um, it was to try and get help for the factory in Lesotho. And I must say that the Danish people helped us a lot. They took some of our people for training to Denmark. And then um, they also sent us uh, to pharmacists from Denmark who were experienced in manufacturing. And uh, with the help, with the help of everybody, we became um, something very good for Lesotho at the time. And uh, we ended up, ex I mean, the Lesotho market is very small, so we, we needed in order to make the unit profitable we had to export some of our products and they were exported to countries like Angola, Mozambique, Zambia, and to the Transkai at the time. Okay. Mm. The tra Transkai at the time because we couldn't get into the South African market. Yes, yeah, so that's uh, after seven years with the factory, I found it uh, a loss-making organization, but by the time I left, it was a profit-making institution with very well qualified people. Obviously uh, you have a good business head too, yeah? <laughs> I'm not sure about that. <laughs> I'm not that sure about that, but uh, it was uh, it was quite a challenge, mm. but very interesting challenge. And how many people worked in the factory at the time? Mm, I think they're about, uh, about 50. So it was big staff, big enough staff? Yeah, big enough staff, big enough staff. I mean, uh, if you call it because uh, we're also doing the distribution of uh, the other products which are not making in Lesotho. Um, we're importing them from outside and distributing them to the health institutions in the country. So it was quite there, uh, it was quite something. And then uh, came 1992, when Lesotho opened up for politics again. Then... The next challenge. My political... Mm. <laughs> the you thought, like why not? Why not? So, there was no politics in your background, but you were very political. I mean, with a small p, you were always yes, political. Yes. Did you stand for your home constituency where you were born? How did you decide that 
you would run for parliament. You obviously still connected to the same party, or were you? Yes, I was still in the same party. I think I was approached by quite a lot of people to sort of stand up for politics. And um, I mean, okay, but at the time, there were there used to be sixty constituencies, and then uh, at the time, 1993, they were moved to sixty-five. So. There were people who were already, I mean, this constituency belonged to some, to another person. So the party decided to split the huge constituency of Maseru because of the population. I think the IEC changed it. They came out about four constituencies plus the original one, so there were five. Then three women. That's how we ended up with three women in parliament we used for elections in those constituencies. And were the three of you from the same party as I Yes, interest? from the same party. And you were the first three women yes. elected to an independent government? Yes. What happened on your first day then? What was it like walking into the parliament on day one <laughs> as an elected representative? As an elected representative. Besides the fact that you were probably high-fiving everybody you met. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. It was quite an experience. Mm. I mean, okay, the procedure of government is something, or parliament is something else. I mean, okay, we had to to be given uh, orientation for about mm. three or four days, how to behave like parliamentarians, what we should expect uh, in parliament, uh, given the um, standing orders governing the behavior in parliament and all those things, but it was, it was really quite So an induction to, program, really? Uh, it was an induction program was done, so... But I think the interesting so you, part was uh, all of us in, the, in parliament belong to the same party, so... So you had a huge opportunity, you knew each other. Yes. So you'd, you'd come through the initial, whoa, I can't believe this, mm. I've been elected. Mm. You've gone through a training session that says, here's what I do. Mm. Then how do you start to become effective? You, you now know the rules, yeah. how do you start yeah. to apply them? I mean, for some of us, initially, that, that it was very sad because uh, I wasn't even a parliamentarian for a long time because immediately I was uh, chosen as a minister, the minister of health. So then that was something else. And I read somewhere, is it true, that you also designed the, the broad programme for combating AIDS in the country? Yes. In fact, what happened was um, the first cases of um, a HIV AIDS were from people from outside Lesotho. But uh, we knew that once it's here, once it got into the country. It. And then we sat down with uh, the, then there was somebody, Dr. Rojas, who was the WHO representative, I said, I think you need to help me with uh, a study, if we can survey 10 years from now, how will HIV AIDS impact the health system in the Sutu? And it is very interesting that uh, that report, that survey that was done, I mean, things, if it had been followed, if we had prepared ourselves and said, uh, let's do things according to what the recommendations that are in this report, I don't think we would have fa found ourselves so overwhelmed. And what mm. did the report recommend then in terms, did the report mm. identify that it would become a, as big a problem yes, worldwide as it is? Yes, worldwide as it is and uh, showed us that uh, if you don't do anything, your facilities are going to be overwhelmed, your staff is going to be overwhelmed, I mean, we'll just run out of uh, ideas of how to, I mean, you know, when you're over him, there's nothing else that you can do. So that's, then they said that you may need to look at some other people who would uh, look after these people, not necessarily in the hospital or in the facilities. That's how we ended up with the, uh, what did they, what did used to call them anyway, they were um, but it's almost a group. It's almost it's a, a twin system, one was a hospital uh, system yes. and one was a specific care system for yes. people with AIDS, HIV. Yes. We used to have what we call community health workers before in Lesotho who, who supported the primary health care program of Lesotho. But now this was something much bigger than what the community health workers were doing and uh, so we we needed to do to have those support groups to look after these patients even at home, make sure that they take their medication, make sure that uh, they eat properly, make sure that they clean them. You know, it was uh, it was really something. In fact, something that touched me very much. One time I was there, we visited a family somewhere in the outskirts of Peru, and um, where there was a patient. There was this patient. Uh, the mother was looking after the girl in a small, tiny room in the seventh squad. If one would put it because the father had said that, uh, you get out of my house. The husband had said, get out of my house. 
Because she had AIDS. Because she had AIDS. And it was a beautiful young lady, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful young girl. And his daughter. And his daughter. Skinny, with bed sores. I mean, okay, it touched my heart so much. I said, good Lord, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? You know, I remember I went to uh, the technical area. I, I just didn't know because... I mean, okay, how do you support somebody with bad sores and everything else? I mean, okay, it was, it was just, just a so huge much. challenge. It was a huge challenge. So then we really realized that we needed a lot of these people. And uh, when the program was sort of uh, really taking root and where people were moving quite well, then I was moved from the Ministry of Health. So the AIDS problem, you're right, is one of, it's human nature. It's mm -hmm. multiple partners. It's, but it, it's still devastating. People still aren't obviously using condoms. Mm. Uh, men and women are mm. not as conscious of it as they should be. And the orphans that are left mm. are a huge issue, mostly for grandparents? Mostly for, for grandparents, but as I say, at least the government is doing something to, to help the grandparents. Uh, they get um, some stipend, if one to put it, it's not enough. But at least it's something they get there, uh, some food or food donations also, just to, to help. So them. it helps. And I presume the antiretrovirals for uh, HIV AIDS patients are low cost or no cost? They're free, they're free, they're given out free. Okay, so mm. that actually makes it very easy mm, to keep it that. under control. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I've made a lot of improvements since then. Mm. So the, you moved from the ministry, you were in the ministry about a year? Is that no, what you no, said? Three the Ministry years. of Health? Three years, okay. Mm -hmm. And then they moved you where? It was then called the Ministry of Natural Resources. At the time, it was um, when um, the Lesotho Highlands Water Project uh, was having a little bit of uh, problems with the funding. And um, I moved there. It was again another challenge, another big challenge. I think my biggest challenge was when I got there, it was just a few months before we were supposed to close the dam at Kazi to start supplying water to South Africa. And my biggest embarrassment was, you supply water to South Africa, what about Lesotho? People don't have water. So you inherited a situation where there was a dam yes. in existence, mm -hmm. which dammed the water that naturally flows through Lesotho, mm -hmm. and nobody in Lesotho could access the water. And nobody from Lesotho could access the water. Much as, I mean, the point, I mean, okay, we were saying, that uh, compared to the amount of water that Lesotho has, this is only a small portion that is going to South Africa. But uh, how do you satisfy somebody in the village who doesn't have water? Mm. I was in that ministry for one year, one and a half years, and then I was moved to another ministry. And in fact, I think the thing that annoyed me, this one is very interesting because, I mean, I was seeing light at the end of the tunnel, and I told the Prime Minister, I said, you know, I. I felt very bad when you moved me from um, health because at least there I was very comfortable to, I didn't know anything about water. But and you knew what you were doing, yeah? Yes, and I said, you know, this is such an important ministry and if we can get it right here, we can get this country developed. And uh, I said, I'm feeling very comfortable. And about a, a month later, then he moved me to me so treat, then I decided to, to resign from coming here. Dr. Radita Pole continued to represent her constituency in Parliament for a further 15 years, but never again accepted a ministerial position. Now in her 80th year, she exudes a passion for social justice that is palpable. A current female member of Parliament is Mrs. Mamoiponi Sensauane. I spoke with her about the dominant role that men play in marriage and in society generally. Tell me now, as a woman representative, um, do you feel do you feel a pressure to represent women? Women look up to you and say she has achieved, she's in the parliament. Do you feel that you should concentrate more on women and do more for them than for men? That's what I'm trying to do. That's what I, uh, I'm here for, representing women. I'm trying my all best to to just to convince them that they are strong, they can also be leaders. I can say I'm their role model. I mm. always tell them that 
there's nothing uh, which is can be had for them to do as women. And is there anything you can tell them, you can show them? Is there any way that you can, that the government can help them? Does it need any grants? Does it need education? What needs to change so that women look at you and say, I'm going to move her over. I want to be in Parliament too. You mean the, the, the women? Mm. What will women? make them feel that power? I think they, they too have that passion. But you know, it's very difficult here in the sort of for a woman to, to achieve whatever she likes because as married um, women, we still have the pressure of our husbands and they don't allow us to be free, I think. We don't have that much for them, most of the women. And are the men then, the husbands, still very much in control? Yeah, too much, too much. So they would... Even not our husbands only, even the, the other, other men in the country. Oh. So how do you change that? Big I question, think, but... There is a big question, but I think they think, I think they need to be... to be trained. Cancel it. See us as people, as they are. Mm -hmm. We are like we are partners. And they don't have to be our, our. Yeah, maybe like they don't have to rule us. Superiors or masters or something. Or something. Yeah. What about the HIV problem? You've a, you've a very significant HIV AIDS problem. Yeah. That's terrible. We have got many orphans in our country. You too. HIV and AIDS. Men die, I, mean, I can say parents die and leave their young ones behind. So they are very, they are very vulnerable. So the children are left children with are no left. parents as orphans? Yeah. And they're minded by the state or by their families? Others by themselves. They're just left alone? Mm, left alone. Why do you think AIDS is so rampant? I think it's because of poverty. Uh, as we go around here in Marcelo, we've got the sex, how do you call it? Sex workers. Because of poverty. Yeah. So that's where it is being spread. I know that you are a role model for your constituents, yeah, that true. they look to you and say, if she can do it, look what she has achieved, I can do the same. Yeah. Who is a role model for you? Who do you admire? In this country? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a tough question. Uh, it? It's a very tough question because we have, there are still some strong women in the country. Many of them are very strong. They are whole models. And, but I can say one of my teachers mm -hmm. used to say, when I was still young, said to me, you know, you are very strong. One day you'll be a role model for the, the other women and girls. And I used to be. So my teacher, I, I really adore her, though she is dead. President of the Olympic Council mm -hmm. and everybody I've spoken in, to in the Sutu has used words like strong, determined, uh, role model, a great leader mm -hmm. and a tough job. What's it like being a woman running the Olympic Council? Just a, a point of correction. I think this is my third term going to fourth term. Uh, the reason being that I started off in, in 2001 as president but before that I started as a member of the executive at the time okay. there were no women in the committee and the International Olympic Committee had recommended that the, the quotas 
or the presence of women in, in the running of the Olympic movement should be felt. So we had a women's um, committee, the Women in Sport Committee. I was vice president at the time, and then I was co-opted into the committee to become an executive member of the National Olympic Committee executive. That I was the first woman to go into, into, the, into office. And um, it would seem that the kind of organization the International Olympic Committee is, is one with vast information uh, and with a lot of programs that when you um, get into it, you really have to study, read, Mm. Uh, get, get conversant with, with the, all the information and also expose your athletes, expose your coaches and your sports administration uh, or administrators into the programs of the, um, the International Olympic Committee. So we had to do a lot of that. Now with my background as a teacher, that helped me a lot because I think in me it was make sure that we have as many people as possible educated about the movement, participating in the movement. In, uh, in that way it helped to, to help to grow the movement because when we got in we found that there weren't quite a number of programs offered. At the time the office was just a one-man office and okay. I would like to invite you to our office and see how big it has grown now. It has not only made its stride in the country but it has within the region and in the, in the, in, in, in the, in the, in the continent as well. So it has not been an easy journey I must admit. Because as I said, we had that small group that was initiating women into sport. Mm -hmm. But even more challenging, <clears throat> women into leadership uh, in sport. And um, coming from a background of um, an African country, uh, we are still we were still seen at the time as belonging to uh, certain sectors, not uh, maybe sitting on the decision-making table. So for us to be able to work with athletes, work with former coaches, try to encourage them to get into national federations and even national federations um, executive committees was a challenge. One so it was a double challenge because you were a woman? It was a double challenge because I was a woman, mm -hmm. yes. And uh, even more now as a woman president because it means um, you are one of the 54 National Olympic Committees in Africa and I remember at the time when I went to our first AGM we were only two women. In Ooh, out of 54. Out of 54. Out of That's 54. a tiny minority. Exactly, exactly and you can imagine the, the questions, the questioning and the grilling that we got from the men. How did you get into to the... as if you it's not. something that fascinates me that mm -hmm. men in a position nobody queries mm -hmm. and women get into the position and they almost say what a clever girl uh, <laughs> can you please really? explain how you got you here always have to explain it's, yourself mm -hmm. how you got in you know has it changed much out of those 54 now are there many more women um currently we we were i think as a continent we we're doing very well compared to the other continents in the Olympic movement. Okay. Because there was a time when we were five out of 54. We have gone down now, I think, to three women out of the, the 54. But there are more women now in other positions like secretary general, treasurers, and, and the likes. So I think, um, in a way, we have played a role of um, uh, showing the main that even in their own countries, they can now consider and help to groom women that can be in the leadership in the executive committees, in the National um, Olympic Committee. We as the National Olympic of Lesotho, has current, we have currently um, um, won a bid to host <coughs> the African Youth Games. That means that we are going to host the biggest event ever in our own country. We are bringing the biggest event ever in our own countries. So this is for it's all of Africa in, that's coming for to Lesotho? That's for all, all of Africa. And what that year? means in 10 days in 2020, we'd we'll be able to bring about maybe 5,000 plus people into our country. So now that speaks to the, the vision that we are talking about. To say, um, for us as a small country, we, we, we realize that for us to be able to participate and able to bring our youth into sport, we needed infrastructure. Mm. And the best way to do that would be to commit ourselves 
and so to speak to bring along our politicians to see the importance that sport can bring in brewing or um, building culture so what so if you bring the games mm -hmm. the benefit to the country is an economic benefit of bringing 5,000 people in most certainly but the benefit to sport is that, that you get the infrastructure you get the, the infrastructure, infrastructure stays behind when the games have left certainly and not only that but also the culture because if there is infrastructure we're expecting our youth to have now a sporting culture they will have a certain um, level of discipline to say if my life, my, my life should be structured in, in such a way that um, I'm involved in this, but I also do part of sport, which brings a lot of discipline and also which um, I think improves the lifestyles of our youth. You said sport. that you were involved in sport from the time that you were very young. Mm -hmm. Is there equality of opportunity for boys and girls, men and women in sport? That's a big question now. <laughs> There's, no easy ones today. Uh, <laughs> that it, there has never been. There has never been, and that is why I think we have a lot of uh, support from the International Olympic Committee, from our African National Olympics Association. As it is, um, my portfolio in Africa is I'm the, I'm the fourth vice president in the executive committee of the African National Olympic Committees, and one of my major roles is to ensure that. There is increase in participation of women in sport as athletes, as coaches, and as sports administrators. There is a big um, challenge to say when, even as I sit on a decision-making table, um, I will admit that when allocations are made to try and realize that, um, that, in, that, that mandate, it becomes a challenge in terms of the amount of um, money that is being uh, put aside for us to be able to pursue those and you really have to be very strong and really uh, have to remain focused so that you can always always in everything that when every decision that is being made make sure that an element of saying okay we need uh, so much to be allocated so that we can have um, a, an increase in the number of women that are put into a particular program. So it always needs to be a focus of everything Stay that you do. Stay alert all the time. I moved from the world of sport to the National University of Lesotho, where I met first with the Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Mantoto De Foto, who shared her vision of education in the future. Yeah. Let me bounce you around a little then and ask you, as a woman in leadership, mm. are you very conscious of a need, do you feel a pressure to help other women, to mentor them or to be a role model to them? to help them in any way, particularly women rather than women and men? Certainly. That, that has been a, one of a, the main challenges that I've had throughout my career. Because a, in my training, I've a, been exposed to a, courses in gender awareness, and I've done such courses. I've gone to a, international conferences and uh, that has become one of the major challenges that I want to make sure that even at the end of the day I can leave it as my legacy to make sure that women are able to access education to start with, to be able to be part and parcel of the management processes where they are. Okay to become exemplary and I therefore try to be as exemplary as I can in most things that I handle. Which is a pressure on you as well. It is quite a pressure on me and of course I do get uh, some criticism in some places a lot of criticism but uh, I'm just looking at women but I think if I can be able to leave a legacy that yes I have empowered women mm. to be the best that they can be. I'll be very happy. Vision for the future. 
if I took you away from this fabulous office and this gorgeous university, brought you off to Mars and let you play with the Martians for 20 years, mm -hmm. and you came back to Lesotho, what, in educational terms, what would you like to see if you were hovering over your campus or hovering yes. over education in the country? Yes. Yes. What would you like to see? I think uh, what I really would like to see is that there is open access for all Basotho. In a different uh, a setting, I would say for women. But you know what? Uh, access has really not been a problem for women in Lesotho. Okay. I think this is because of historical background where men used to go to mines and you find that it is women who are behind and therefore women who are able to access education and make sure that children, most children, especially girls, are in school. But I would like to see Lesotho as a country that has that open access for women, for all groups who are in disadvantaged uh, situations, especially for us, it is the head boys who always have to mind the cattle and the sheep out there mm. and do not get the opportunity, good opportunity to be at school. I think we have to apply skills, strategies that can help bring boys into the education system. And let me tell you, one such strategy is the distance education strategy. I have uh, worked and studied under this for distance education and I am convinced that countries that engage distance education are able to open access at whatever level so that those who are disadvantaged out there can be able to access education through open and distance education methods. I left the Pro Vice Chancellor and met with the Registrar, Mrs. Deet Boto, Makalika Deratholi, and the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities, Mrs. Beatrice Ekayune Ilongo. I first asked Mrs. Deratholi how she became Registrar of the University. While I was there, I noted that there was a gap. I think we were undergoing transformation at this university. Mm -hmm. And for twice, I saw an advert for <coughs> a registrar. And they advertised. I knew something happened towards recruiting. Then they re-advertised. When they re-advertised the third time, I said, no, 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 no. Is it true we can't get a registrar in this country? Yes. Then I threw it in. <coughs> and I remember one of my relatives was saying, are you really serious? You want to go there? You know why yeah. people would be asking. Mm -hmm. There was a bit of a turmoil at that time with trans transformation, transformation processes which were not ending. Then I applied. Um, whether it was difficult for me as a woman or not, I'm coming back to your question. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't know, but I don't think so. Because we started off with an initial shortlist of seven people. I remember there were two women in that list, initial list of seven, and the rest of were men. Then the, the first stage of elimination was, was they, they made us write something. Mm -hmm. We presented a written uh, assessment, piece of assessment. Mm -hmm. and then the list was cut down to three, two, two men and myself. And we went to the oral interviews. We went to the psychometric testing and and I came through and I'm like, I don't think it was difficult because I was ready. If I had come earlier, mm -hmm. the idea okay. of whether I'm competing as a woman or not would probably have surfaced. But it didn't really surface that much because at that moment I thought I was ready. Mm -hmm. That's interesting that you, your career had developed to such a stage it where you were <coughs> actually gender blind. You didn't feel you were competing against men or women. You no. were just competing for the job. Even if it's confident. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Even 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 when I was told that the race is getting hotter, 
it's me and two men. I said, which men? And they told me the names of the men. I said, no, no, no. They are not a threat. <laughs> <laughs> there speaks a competitive woman. Tell me who they are so that I can figure yeah, out yeah, are yeah. they a threat to me. I looked at them. They were my colleagues, <coughs> but they were quite junior in experience mm. in the area mm. where I have been. Yeah. In conversation, Mrs. Elongo told me of her election by her peers as dean of the faculty. I had a feeling that things weren't quite as relaxed as she made them seem. So did Boho, was it really that simple? She makes it sound like she was just the right woman for the job. <laughs> yes, she was the right woman, but it wasn't as easy as she presented it. Um, she, she, she got the right votes. The majority of the faculty still nominated her as the, as the dean of the faculty. But like she said, there was competition. And when competition was beaten, gymnastics began. And when gymnastics began, we began to see a whole, a whole lot of other issues, which initially at the beginning of the competition were not relevant. The, the, the gender issue, the age issue, the nationality, which really are not relevant. So this was the defeated candidate was saying what about the winning candidate? The, the, the defeated candidate began to indicate that she was a professor, a full professor, when the winner was an associate professor, yet both of those qualifications qualify them to be dean. So there was no issue about it. She began to highlight the fact that he was a man and Beatrice was a woman. And, and then what? It was never an issue. We didn't say we are looking for a man or a woman. We said faculty. Who are you looking at? They nominated two, they voted, they picked one. And, 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 and his age also was an issue because I think he maybe 20 years older than, than the winner. And when all those didn't work, there was the nationality issue and, and management. As management, we had to say, this must stop now. This is no longer part of the, the competition. The competition is over. A winner has been elected and, and hooray. And all I'm saying is some of the challenges that we encounter as women mm. are, are hidden yeah. because the competition was over and there was no need for the gymnastics, yet they continued. And unfortunately, they were still supported by some of the members of the faculty. Your colleagues who are around you, they are equally as qualified as all of the men. That's a given. Um, do they work as hard? Do they work harder? Oh yes, they do. Um, like you rightly said, they are as qualified as the men in terms of qualifications and uh, other stuff. But they do more work than the, the men. In fact, if we were to quantify, I could say they do five times what the men do. Because most of the women in my faculty, and I think across the university, are wives, they are mothers, they are sisters, you know, women are always the, the, the ones that take care of the family. So not only will they take care of their academic careers, but they are also there to make sure that the children are fine, the husband, who some of them are with them here in the university, are taken care of, you know, extended family and so on and so forth. And in all of that, their work also has to come in. So to see that the women are moving, you know, some of them are senior lecturers, some of them are at the professorial level. To see that they are moving like that tells you that the women are actually doing a lot. They are putting in a lot of work. Because we need to create time to be able to grow academically, to write papers, attend conferences, you know, publish and all of that. It, it takes a lot of time. I'm speaking with Mrs. Mabutu Bile Shebe. She is a lay minister with the Anglican Church of Lesotho, a parish leader for the Mothers' Union at St. Agnes, diocesan secretary for the Mothers' Union, and a member of the diocesan council representing lay people. You are one very busy woman. Yes, I am. How did you become a minister? Uh, it started off um, as a um, I got married to my husband who's an Anglican. I wasn't an Anglican before. Then I think to readjust into the new church, new denomination, had some kind of effect on me. And after a few years having been married to him, I started to have visions. 
which I never actually understood what they meant. Then some people advised me you should go to such and such a church. They will, you will be able to embrace the gift. It's kind of a gift of descent that God has given you. And I didn't really understand what that was. And um, in, two, in 2000, I think, I met a lady who is a, a wife of a priest in the Anglican Church. And I told her about my visions. And she said to me, maybe you are called into the ministry of lay, lay ministry. She told me that what you are seeing, because I was telling her what I was experiencing in my visions way, they involved a robe, a white robe with a black um, kind of, it's called a scapula, but at the time I didn't know what it was called. Okay. And... Uh, with a cross similar to this, but it was shiny. That was the vision I used to have every time. And when I woke up, my hands would have, I can have words again. Numb. They would be numb, my hands and my feet. And I would wake up and start praying. And this lady told me that she thinks I'm called into the ministry of the lay ministry. In the, in the church, in the Anglican church. And what is the Mother's Union? Mother's Union is, a, is an Anglican Women's Guild that was formed by Mary Sumner in England in 1876. Uh, we, when her first daughter got married and was expecting a child, Mary Sumner felt it is time to organize women within my parish so that we can be able to assist women in, marriage, in, in family life because she had noticed that she had some difficulties as you, you, you don't have children, you said. No. But, you know, uh, nurturing, growing up children, looking after them is quite challenging. Then she felt it was time that as mothers, all the mothers within the church, we should be there for the family, our children's families and others. So is the Mother's Union a combination of older mothers and younger mothers and just women helping women mm. in family life? Yes. In my church, I would be lying if I said we are striving to change the culture. We are just trying to improve the family life and to care for the destitute within the communities where we exist. Uh, we are kind of, even our vision this year, it is, it is that we should be the mothers, the members that conform to the authorities. And most unfortunately, our authorities currently in our church, it's men, mostly men. And can women become ministers in the Anglican Church? Yes, they are. We are actually celebrating 25 years of um, admission of women into clerical positions within the church. I'm interested in the fact that you're a controversial lady. Did you never consider becoming a priest in the parish? I have. That is why I signed up, uh, I applied into the Fellowship of Vocations to test my calling. And um, in 2010, I was on the list of people who were going to be ordained into becoming deacons in the Anglican Church. Uh, unfortunately, on the last day that we were called in with, together with our families to be briefed, I was informed that of the seven people that we were, the seventh person was not going to be ordained. That was on a Friday. And uh, we asked, uh, who is this person? And the, our tutor then said, it's very sad because the person who's, going, who's not going to be ordained is one of the best, of the best of my students. And she's not going to be ordained because there are some unsigned letters that the bishop says he has received. And one of the people there, one of the ordinance said, 
why are you misleading people? Why can't you make people tell people the right way of dealing with things and throw away those letters? He said, I advise the bishop not to consider the, the letters, but he said he's going to use them. He's going to adhere to what these people are saying. And um, so, so the letters were unsigned. Mm -hmm. Do you know where they were from? I presume they were from within your own parish. There were people who knew you. What did the letters say? Uh, the bishop told us that the letters were from my parish, but they were unsigned. But he told us who delivered the letters. And uh, he said, he didn't really give us the letters, but he said the letters had some uh, information that would uh, break up our family. And But through the grapevine, I learned that the letters in, contained issues of adultery that I was blamed for, and issues of uh, embezzlement of funds, issues of low, bad morals that I was blamed for. And uh, <clears throat> on that particular day when families were invited to come and be briefed, the bishop's wife was asked by the bishop to say something, if she wanted to say something, and she did stand up and said, oh, you know, if you have low morals, bad morals, people will hate you. People from your church will not never like you. And uh, that was that. I wasn't ordained. Well, for the record, let me ask you, have you got low morals? No, I don't. Have you ever embezzled any funds? No. Have you ever had an opportunity to answer the allegations that were made against you? No. The bishop refused to call, set up a tribunal as it is the rule of the church that where there are suspicions of misconduct of anyone in the church, it doesn't matter which position you are in, even if you are just a member, ordinary member, if people, members of your community suspect you of not upholding yourself in such a way that you would uh, represent the, the church in a good way. That's fair enough because you're a minister and you are expected to have a certain standard. Yes, yeah. yes, but I was never allowed an opportunity to answer that. My last conversations in Lesotho were with four businesswomen from the media, finance, social enterprise and tourism sectors. Jamie's group is basically a mentorship social enterprise that focuses on young people and women. The reason being that I felt like, you know, through all these experiences that I've had, uh, that there is a shrinking space for young people and for women. There, there, there just wasn't enough. Or if there was, they were limited to doing two certain things. Uh, why am I saying this? Because our programming focuses on creative industries and people think I'm crazy. And I do believe them. I, I, I think they're a crazy. <laughs> <laughs> we look into, we have a program or an initiative that is called SWIFT, SWIFT Codes. So what is Swift calls is sisters working in film, fashion, uh, farming, technology, and programming or coding. Wow. So it's a combination of these crazy things. That's a very broad sweep. It, <laughs> is. Yeah. it really is. But then you ask yourself, what about other industries? The creative industries is mostly because it's also technical. You see a lot of men. Mm, it's lots true. and lots of men. So that is the shrinking space for me to say, how do we then expand the space for women to be part of that? Mm. So can we see more women in the film industry, mm -hmm. uh, booming the camera, uh, you know, things like that. It's an interesting area when you mention film. I remember some actress being interviewed, and I can't remember who she was, at the time of the Harvey Weinstein um, scandal. Yeah. And she said that she never felt comfortable on a film set because she was very often the only woman. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it really brought it home, camera men, sound men, mm -hmm. directors were men. Yeah. Producers were men, and it was only when she said it, you kind of get this ka-ching moment going. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I never actually realised that. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you for that. Um, Diga lady, yes. what's your story? How did you get to where you are? Okay, so I was raised here in Mas in Lesotho, in Maseru, by my grandmother. Um, I lost my parents. Uh, my dad at four years old and my mom at 11. Um, and so I grew up um, very driven to prove society wrong because in the Sotu, um, people have these ideas about orphans, you know, that they are difficult, that they will not amount to anything. And, you know, these are things that my sister and I would hear growing up. And so I grew up with this strong sense that I need to become something because I need to prove the whole of society wrong. Um, I studied in South Africa and worked in South Africa. Um, I qualified as a chartered accountant. Um, and during my time um, when I was working, doing my articles, I joined an organization called the Association for the Advancement of Black Accountants in Southern Africa. And through that, I really learned how to be a servant leader. I, had, I grew this passion to um, use my skills, my professional skills, to serve my community. And so um, after I qualified, um, I went through this time when I was trying to figure out what am I going to do with my qualification. Um, and I remember thinking, I think it's time to go back home. I think I can use my skills to impact my society. So in 2015, I moved back to Lesotho and I started consulting as an independent consultant and eventually registered a company which is Inspire uh, Innovation Business Consultants. And with it, I really want to impact my community. I want to impact the SME sector. Um, I do a lot of um, leadership development uh, things. I'm also involved in leadership roles. And so I am really still this you know, young girl at heart uh, who wants to impact her community positively. Can I ask you a question as a white person? I've never heard of an association of white accountants. <laughs> <laughs> what is an association of black accountants and why? So as you may know, this is a South African organization. Um, as you may know, South Africa um, went through a time when there was apartheid where black people were excluded from being involved in professions like accounting, uh, medicine, and you know other important uh, professions. Uh, they were relegated to n being nurses and teachers and those kind of professions. So um, when so in I think the organization was founded in 1985 when a group of very few accountants then there were very few black accountants then in South Africa came together and said, how are we going to work together to make sure that we advance black people? And one slight supplement. You wanted to prove the whole of society wrong? Yes. No <laughs> pressure then. <laughs> <laughs> are the orphans that badly regarded? Because yes. orphans are orphans because their parents died, not because they chose yes. to kill their parents. Yes. yes. <laughs> so they haven't had any choice in it. Yes. Why are the expectations so low for all? Um, I don't really know where it comes from. I think it's one of the things that I'm trying to understand as an adult right now, um, taking care of uh, an orphan uh, cousin of mine. And I'm really, really trying to understand why the Basutu society has that attitude towards orphans. I started the company with my two sisters, black sisters, I'm a twin actually. So it was me and my younger sister. We started in 2005. That's when we started our first company, which is BEM Consultancy. And the reason we started was because the three of us, we knew all along, because from school we got employed, but we knew all along that we wanted to run our own business. I, got, I think we got the inspiration from our parents because they're both entrepreneurs. And then eventually we were like, okay, now we have a newspaper, but uh, what are we doing about women? There's magazines, you know, women have different interests. That's when we decided to introduce another publication, which is Finite Magazine. And uh, that is a women empowerment magazine, which we felt is a platform for Basutu women to be promote, promoted in various aspects. And uh, we're very happy because it has, it has been doing so well. And because of that magazine, we also decided to introduce what we call Finite Women Appreciation Awards, which is happening every single year. I think we're coming for the ninth awards uh, this particular year, where we normally nominate women from all over the country. And, and then we select the best women in different categories. We normally change them every year, like it will be hospitality, it will be accounting, it will be entrepreneurship in general. I mean, it all depends on where the flow is. So we, we decided to start with BEM Consultancy and then because of those two publications, then we introduced another company which is called BEM Media, which housed now the informative newspaper. It's a weekly free publication that we started with. And then we have Finite Magazine and then we have Achiever Magazine. That one is an online, an online publication 
that focuses mainly on the youth. But what is interesting is we always diversify depending on where the, 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 the mood is going in, at any given time. Like we don't stick to one particular area and say we are stuck here so we are not changing whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Because the stories about all these publications, they're quite interesting how they started and where they are right now. And then eventually my sister, my twin sister was in Paris and she had mentioned that when she was there she always used to appreciate the, the, the issue of art, you know, like art in Lesotho, we don't take it that seriously. Yeah. I like what she yeah. said, we don't take it that seriously. So she, she felt this pride when she was there overseas, like I want us to do something about art in Lesotho. And that's when we introduced another company that is called Ben Promotions, uh, where we were basically promoting art, artists in the country. So eventually, now I've, taken, I've, I've talked about three companies, and then eventually we realized that a lot of people ask us like you guys how do you make it how come you you've money your sisters your friends your business partners how do you do it and then the two of us myself and my twin we wrote a book that was called twin talk distinguish or extinguish yourself it, it basically talks about great title <laughs> <laughs> pressure to conform you're a young woman everybody i speak to in lesotho says it's all very well being a woman but Really, it sounds like your husband has a huge amount of control, <laughs> that if he says you really shouldn't go any further, you don't go any further, that you are always expected, no matter how successful you are in business, to cook and clean and mind the home and look after the children. Is there a huge extra pressure? Yeah, so I think, first of all, uh, there's a lot of pressure from in-laws uh, when you come into a home because you know in the Soto we say you are married and you are married into a home you're not really married to this man you know you're married into his family so there's a lot of pressure I think from that view because I think people have defined uh, what a woman a Musoto woman looks like mm -hmm. a Musoto woman who's married and has children this is you know how she should behave this is the kind of clothes she should wear and this is um, how she should prioritize her family um, and I think uh, the pressure that I felt in marriage has not really come from my husband at all. Um, I think there's been pressure for him to have certain expectations of me that are not really his own ideas. And when we started, uh, we talk a lot with my husband, uh, we sit down and we have a lot of conversations. And when we start having these conversations, then we become very honest about, you know, um, like he feels this pressure, but it's not really his own pressure. Because when my husband and I met uh, at a conference, we were both speaking at the conference. So I've always been very uh, truthful about who I am and you know the kind of person that I aspire to be. And so he's always known that you know uh, I'm not really going to be that woman who is like a stay-at-home mom, taking care of care kids and you know cooking all day. Uh, but I think I have had to go through a lot of changes as a married woman. Um, I didn't really care for cooking. Not that I couldn't cook, but you know, I grew up in boarding school, in university, I was a nerd, just always studying and eating noodles and anything that was good to prepare. Uh, but there was a lot of pressure when I started, when I was married, you know, my husband would look at me like, so what are we eating today? <laughs> <laughs> and I'd be like, you know, what do you want to eat? I'm cool. Do you want to eat something? Um, and I had to learn how to cook. Um, and But I made it very easy for myself. So I'm an Excel type of woman. So I have an Excel spreadsheet with recipes for the week and I go sh grocery shopping once a week and I'm sorted. I don't have to go every day. I don't have to worry about you know menus and stuff. So I feel like um, there has been a lot of pressure but I have made it very easy for myself and I have stayed very true to myself um, and I believe that's what women should do. I'm a mom of three uh, but actually my, I have two kids and then I have adopted one because it's my sister's child. Paris died, and then now it's mine. It's an office. Fate, yeah. Yeah, so she stayed with me, and then now. But she got married. She's, she's, uh, she's married and she's staying in Sweden, but now they're here with their kids to visit him. But uh, I also have a daughter in law. So now, you know, the family is growing. <laughs> so I have two kids, and then my, my child, when she was 17, she was involved in an accident. And then, you know, she became a child, and it was hard for me because now she, she you know, was taking care of her as a baby because she can't walk, but she can use her hands only, okay. up to here in the head and mostly. So I had to convince my child that she can continue her studies because she got her next day when she was uh, doing her from, from the, the 
like the high school uh, education. It was at the end of her high school education. And then now she's, you know, she had a break of one year. And then all her friends and the, the colleagues, they, they all went to the university. And then she felt a little bit of a pressure. And she said, Mom, hmm, when they come, and then they are telling me that they are in this uh, universities, what will I say? I said, you'll be going to the university. I said, do you think I can make it? I said, you will. Definitely, you will. You know, from this stage where you couldn't even move and do anything, you are here. And then from here, you will you'll do anything. And we will support you 100%. So I said, but you'll do it in Lesotho. Because our businesses will be near you. We can't, you can't be in South Africa. Because now, you know, we'll leave our businesses and be with you. So I sat down with her and then she, she went to the University of Lesotho. But we went with her to the University to say her demands. So I said, you are going to tell them what you want so that we can be able to attend the classes. You know what you are not me, you. So I empowered my daughter to be able to, to, to say anything. She, she, she demanded ramps, she demanded a room with a bathroom for herself. She demanded everything, but she was with a helper throughout her four years. So she studied in the University of Lesotho for four years. And then now she came back and then when she came back and said, Mom, I can't work. Lesotho, no rooms. All the jobs that I'm, I'm getting because I'm a social worker, I can't. I can't go to the offices and so on. I said, what is your plan? We'll support it. I said, you know, I love beauty. Maybe I can do a beauty thing. But, you know, beauty will be my, my first thing, but actually I wanted to have a rehab. Because after the rehabilitation, she was struggling because we didn't know, we didn't have a physiotherapist. There are few in the Soto. And then she was we were struggling to do exercises that uh, she, she was supposed to do with us. But we gave her that time to do exercises with her. But now at the end, now she, she said I wanted to have a, a beauty spa. And then from the beauty spa, we, now we are, this day we are planning to expand it to have less, just a big room for rehab. So that they can start, she has started doing physio with a, a physiotherapist from the Lesotho uh, uh, Army. So that guy is helping her. So now they are, they are playing with both with the guy to expand it, to do it with maybe that room with people who really need a physio. The creative industries is even, is even more interesting mm -hmm. uh, because we have a binary. You have the guys that are technical. And then you have the women, especially in the you know the, the film the film, the, the film side. Uh, women are mostly actors or actresses. Mm. So if you get a good role, it is because you've slept with the director or the executive director, uh, producer, or, or somebody who holds you know a, 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 a significant um, position in the you know among amongst the crew. So yes, there is that perception, and yes, sometimes yes, it does actually happen mm. because. There are reasons to do that. And has the hashtag Me Too campaign had any effect at all in the sushi? No. Not quite, or maybe yes. It depends which, 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 which <laughs> who are you talking about? Um, you see, Lesotho is a very interesting space yeah. because there's always, always a binary. You will have a binary of women who are educated, and then the hashtag Me Too applies. Mm -hmm. You know, they pick up that conversation very, very, very easily. Mm -hmm. And then you have, you know, the women in the rural areas who experience this kind of things, or young women. Mm -hmm. They may not necessarily be in the rural areas, they're still in town, but they are your actresses. And you know, they are not very conversant about this kind of um, big conversations. But there's also need. There's a need to feed. So sometimes when you talk about you know, this, this gender pressures and what happens in industry, it becomes a complicated conversation because sometimes you are forced into the circumstances to be what you, you are. It is not necessarily who you are, mm -hmm. it's what you are. Uh, DK, I want to ask you about another thing that I'm really conscious of uh, <coughs> while I'm here in Lesotho, and that's faith and the importance of faith. It seems to be a very religious society. Um, it seems to be a very Christian society. Uh, it seems to be important as part of the culture in the way that it used to be in Ireland, but isn't anymore. Yeah. I feel like now I'm taking all the contribution. <laughs> 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 um, so, uh, for me as a business person, first of all, uh, faith is very central to me as a human being. 
and but I've, I, I I believe that the way faith has been interpreted um, in our society has largely been to um, make, maintain the status quo of you know keeping women sort of in the background. So faith has been used as a controlling mechanism for women. Yes, basically. yes, and you know things that as a married woman that you'll hear a lot is you know you need to submit to your husband. Your husband has authority, has a final say, uh, and you know the husband is the head of the home. And these are all things that I believe in as a Christian woman. But the way I translate them in my life does not mean that you know my husband controls me. It doesn't mean that I don't have a say. It doesn't mean that I can't use my skills um, and whatever else that I have to help run the home or to make decisions in in you know in my home. Um, you hear a lot of uh, people say that you know when you come into the home, which is the the big home, the communal home, you need to leave your chartered accountancy profession outside mm. because you know. Here we want you to be a wife, and I say, but I bring everything that I am. Yeah. yeah. I have uh, two organizations. I can say two societies that I I have developed, or I am involved in. The first one is the Lesotho Hotels and Hospitality Association, whereby it's ninety percent women. So there we 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 help each other to grow our businesses. So I was the first, uh, immediately when I quit my job, I was the first one to go to South Africa for the exhibition. They, they had this association people were just sitting there and then they didn't do anything. And I told them, no, we have money. Where can we go and, uh, and sell the sutu and advertise ourselves? So advertise our sutu and our businesses. They were saying, ah, no, we can't do that. And I went, I went alone. So, so I have another association of women. So I found that, you know, as women, uh, we don't take care of ourselves. Yeah. We take care of our families, mm. as Mary said. We take care of our kids, mm. we take care of our husbands, but we don't take, take care of ourselves. Mm. So, and then we formed the association of 18 women, whereby we, we contribute money every month. The other one is for entertainment, investment, and the other one is like uh, security money amongst ourselves to, to do projects. Mm. So, we think that uh, we, I started saying, you know, we have never been out. We have never been out of resort, and then we found that few women have never been out of resort. Mm -hmm. So we started saying, with our investment money now, every year we take a trip. Mm -hmm. We have been to cruise. We have been to the sea. We been. We wanted to. Some uh, two of our members have never been in a plane. So we are organizing a, a, a journey where we will fly to some to a certain country so that they can be in the plane and, and experience that. When I flew in uh, at the start of the week, I thought that the country looked very green. And it reminded me that one of the things I had read about Lesotho in advance was that you are probably the most water-rich country, certainly mm -hmm. one of the most water-rich countries in Africa. But when I mentioned it to you, you did not respond favourably. There's an issue with water because you've massive dams, you actually you tap all of the water and you sell it to South Africa. So from an outsider's perspective, it looks like you've nailed it, you've got it right. What have you got wrong? Everything. The deal, <laughs> the deal was wrong from the beginning. Yeah. It was a bad deal. Mm. Uh, why a bad deal? When you draw a deal like that, that does not have the voice of the nation, then you know we are hard done. That is what our dams are doing to us because we don't have access to those dams. dams. We just have this mess of water, but we can't use the water because uh, it has to go to South Africa. South Africa has all the rights and it determines how the water is used. So the water can't be used to irrigate your own land? No. no. Incredible. Until when? The deal is signed up to watch It's a lifetime deal. It's, it's a lifetime deal. Oh, well, um, I think my vision for, for Lesotho would be to see Lesotho being as productive as humanely possible. Everybody, you know, open up spaces so that we have inclusive systems. Like I'm saying, uh, my, my organization is, is more about inclusivity. It's, about, it's more about disrupting this unequal and um, um, dissatisfying spaces. So my vision would be to see every girl child being whatever they want to be, whatever they can be, and the society allowing them to be what they should be or what they want to be. 
because sometimes we talked about an issue of education where the Lesotho child or the Lesotho girl has access to education. But when we come to the practice of education, then we see the girl child lagging behind. So I want to see a child or a girl child who is able to use the education that they have had to be the best that they can be. If we can get to a point where practice and policy match each other, then I would say Lesotho has arrived. So an inclusive society in which nobody actually notices the equality of women. Mamothi, what's your vision for the future? <laughs> huge. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, uh, people, uh, they, they flew from their country to go to Cape Town to see the table mountains. Mm -hmm. How many table mountains do we have in the sort? Mm -hmm. So there's so many. Mm -hmm. We have beautiful mountains that we can walk, wires and zip them. We have beautiful valleys, but we don't use them. Mm -hmm. So my vision is if maybe we can be able to, even if it's one project that we can do, and then use the mountains to benefit Lesotho and bring more, more tourists into our country. For me, I think I have two main visions. The first one is, you know, as a young person, um, I want to see a country where that knows what to do with the passion that young people have. Uh, a lot of young people right now are doing so much despite the resources mm -hmm. that are not there, despite you know, a political system that's not really working. So I, I would like to see a country where young people are developed adequately, when young people come out of school, where we know what to do with them, and we are ready for them, and we are ready to bring out that talent that's in them, and to nurture it, and to employ it into making this country what it's supposed to be. And secondly, as a woman, I would like to see a country where young girls are nurtured, and they grow up in safe spaces, in in healthy spaces and they are taken care of and they are really encouraged to be the best that they can be and they are not defined according to who their father is or who their mother is or who they are married to but young women that are encouraged to stand as individuals and to be who they want to be. You know when you look at Lesotho it has so much potential yeah. so much potential yes. but um, you see our leadership is yeah. corrupt. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to put it like yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, our leadership is corrupt to an extent that they have collapsed the country. Yeah. I want to see an Lesotho where resources are being used correctly. Mm -hmm. yeah. A situation where we know people are not put into positions because of who they are, mm. but because of the skills that they have. You know, it, it shouldn't matter which political affiliation yes. you come from. It should be about what can you do for the country. And I'm also looking, you see, we are at a space where we're fighting for women a lot, and I'm a woman for that matter. But I'd like us to take cognizance of gender equality, not necessarily feminism. Exactly. exactly. Because um, there's, <laughs> there's, there's a thin line and people tend to, yes. you know, confuse the two. Yes. Yeah. And we are at a point where we need to appreciate that women, true enough, they have to be empowered. But at the same time, they have to be in certain positions, not because they are women, mm -hmm. but because they deserve that at the same power with their counterparts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are competent in that yeah. space. Mm -hmm. And that says, while we are caring for the girl child which I advocate for 100% let's not forget the boy, boy child, child because if we forget the boy child we're going to traumatize them and they're going to want to fight to be recognized as well so I'm just saying let's recognize the boy child let's recognize the girl child and let's make them appreciate that they're both human beings that needs to be to, to grow in a safe space the two of them so that men can be able to you know, to care for the women because naturally that is that is how it's supposed to be. And be and allies. Thank you. And yeah. be allies at the yeah. same time. So that's the vision I have for Lesotho where we're just saying, everybody, just, let's just throw our expertise mm -hmm. and grow Lesotho because it has so much potential. But at this rate, ah, politics, man. our politics, are, I think we just need to, a complete overhaul. Yeah. Overhaul of yeah. our political system. I have to tell you, ladies, I want to come back. I want to <laughs> to agree that you will implement all of your strategies. <laughs> and as far as I can tell, we will then have a Lesotho which will choose its own space and own it. Mm -hmm. We will have a situation where youth employment rather than youth mm -hmm. unemployment yes. is what you discuss. Mm -hmm. We will have an equal recognition of boy child and girl child. Mm -hmm. 
The society in Lesotho will be inclusive, it will be a nurturing environment, it will respect the equality of women, the resources of tourism will be exploited for the benefit of the people of Lesotho, for the Basotho themselves, political promotion or political positions will be on merit, and there will be a spotlight on the competence of women. Yes. Competence yes. seems an inadequate word for the circumstances. Viva. Thank you all very much. Viva. Thank you so much. Very much.